Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Today is October 11th, 2017, and you're listening to our second Human Factors Cast, HFES 2017 bonus episode. I'm live from HFES in Austin, Texas, and I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, man, we are back at it again for a bonus episode. I'm liking this three nights of podcasts in a row, Mr. Nick. Dude, these bonus episodes are amazing. I love them, and I love that we can bring this whole no- HFES or human factors practitioner left behind mentality to uh, HFES, but I am I am so exhausted from this week of networking and networking and networking. Oh, you've got to be, man! But I'm sure it's been a good experience. So, you, how was today? How did it go for you? So overall, today went well. Uh, today was a very networking heavy day. So last night, I promised our listeners that we would not have a long show, and we had a long show. So I'm not going to say anything about that tonight, but if it's a little shorter, you know why. Uh, so <laughs> let's just jump right into this thing. So um, what I did today was I went to the environmental design potpourri um, session, and uh, in this, there were uh, five different papers. There was active sitting, active standing, uh, algorithmic solutions to improve command center layout. Uh, and also, let's see here. Sorry, folks, I didn't have time to transcribe all my notes into a uh, <laughs> online format. So I'm, I'm kind of scrambling through papers here. Sleep-related habitability issues on U.S. Navy ships and um, open office design. And I'm probably messing up some of these names because I did shorthand, but let's just go through them. Uh, I also went to, or I chaired a session as well in virtual environments. Uh, and we can get to that just after this one. So let's break down this environmental design potpourri. So first off was active sitting. Uh, obviously there is a lot of talk about maybe sitting is the new smoking. Is it a health hazard? These types of things, uh, they were looking into some alternatives to sitting. So some of these uh, different types of seats, right? You have uh, like this um, a spring chair, a cord chair, and the conventional chair. And they were kind of uh, measuring the three of them. I'm going to kind of glance over these. Please ask me if you have any questions, Blake, because uh, I'm going to kind of go through these a little quick. Yeah, I'm like I said, to know what active sitting means. Is that just the difference in a chair you're sitting in, or are you actually doing some kind of change in position? Like, what's going on with the active part? So, active sitting, I think they defined as something where you are actively trying to um, orient your body. So, if you have one of these core chairs where uh, you know your feet are tucked underneath, you're kind of uh, mod- uh, monitoring your posture such that you are you have a better posture or these core chairs where it's just the, the exercise ball and you're sitting on top of that to where you are kind of balancing yourself. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's more related just to making sure depending on what chair you're in, you have good like spinal posture and that kind of stuff. Well, it's more about being active or, or actively trying to correct your posture while you're in these uh, seats. So they were, uh, they were looking at several different factors, right? Intensity, performance, uh, comfort, posture, fatigue, and um, I'm going to jump straight to the results here. They, they found that there was no significant difference in performance, uh, no significant difference in posture, um, nor pain. And uh, the only thing that they found significance with was comfort and fatigue. And um, obviously, comfort is lower for the exercise ball and fatigue is higher for the exercise ball. So that's kind of what they found. Obviously, this was a short-term uh, study. Uh, it was a short-term task in the study. It was a college sample, and uh, you know they wanted to look into longitudinal stuff in the future. Yeah, I was about to say that would be the way to go for one of these, because especially if you're using like one of those core chairs, doing it in a short-term study is not going to do it any justice, because you probably don't have adequate core strength to keep yourself up. So you, I would imagine, not seeing any kind of improvement in performance, especially if you're getting fatigued by just sitting, right? So it'd be interesting to see what they pull from a longitudinal study. Yeah, and I think that's the next step, so we'll see there. Um, Jumping into the next one, active standing. This one was done by uh, the same institution, and uh, shoot, I don't have the thing in front of me, but uh, same institution, different team. 
but the methods were basically the same, uh, just with the only differences being they were looking at uh, standing. And so they were looking at balance boards, inflatable mats uh, versus a hard floor. Oh, that's cool. And what what they did they found, find based off of those? Because that's some pretty cool variables. Yeah, so what they found was no significant difference. Um, but, uh, you know, that's that's nice to know. There, wow. there was no significance in the whole, like, no difference between the three. Oh, I mean, uh, across again, the gamut was... of, like, what they measured, even, like, comfortability or being comfortable and fatigue, like, I wouldn't expect a difference in performance, to be honest, but not even with, like, comfortableness? Yeah, no, uh, no sig for comfort, uh, no sig for pain, no wow. sig for performance. Yeah. Well, shit. Yeah, I was, I know. That was interesting, for sure. Um, so let's see here. The next one was uh, algorithmic solution to improve command center layout. And uh, on this one, I literally put down a couple of things, then math, then a couple question marks, and then profit for how they did this. Because there was some magic going on that is a little bit beyond my reach of understanding. Wow. Um, but I will try to, <laughs> I'll try to break it down the best I can. Well, it's so funny listening um, to the names so, of some of these, right? Because we're talking about active sitting, active standing, then algorithm expression of control centers. I can't even imagine the jump in topic there. <laughs> That's so crazy. Well, it was it was a potpourri. And I like going to these potpourris because it's it's kind of a grab bag of stuff. It's, it's really kind of up in the air of what you're going to get. Um, but anyway, so this was done with the DRDC in Canada. So that's the Defense Research and Development uh, Canada wing. Um, it's basically the Canadians' uh, equivalent of the DR, uh, the DOD here in America. Okay. So facial cool. layout. Oh, oh, there. Yeah, hold on, Nick. You're going to need to rewind because you were gone for a good, like, three to four seconds. Yeah, I know. JW Marriott, everyone. Write them uh, your complaints for Human Factors, Caspi, and Shoddy this week. <laughs> we're going to have to make do with it. So um, they wanted to develop a modeling uh, solution for creating these spatial layouts in command centers. Right? There's lots of people working in a group. You have collaboration and communication that need to happen across these groups. And you need to find out what the optimal solution is. Right, There's this mapping problem of how do you feed into an algorithm these parameters and how does it spit back out um, the appropriate sort of uh, configuration. And um, so they, they're using this algorithm. It's a computational search algorithm. It's not neural. It's genetic, which I didn't even realize that there were several types of um, like learning algorithms, which is interesting because genetic algorithms kind of treat it like an organism, right? It can evolve over time and select those superior layouts, and those superior layouts survive and evolve onto the next steps. And I thought that was a really interesting sort of metaphor for how this uh, algorithm works. Wow, that's um, kind of like going back to yesterday when we talked about the influence of bi like just biotechnology in like the aviation tool or the uh, reconnaissance tools for the like tuna bot and the dolphin. I mean, this is again looking at our biology to influence basically in this case algorithms. That's a really good point that I didn't even connect. Yeah, we we are definitely. Uh, getting some of these influences from nature. Well, sure. yeah, and there's like a big uh, debate in the community of AI and machine learning too. Like, is that the smartest way to go? Or should we be trying to look for something really abstractly outside of that? And there's this battle between, do we follow what we see in nature or do we drive for something new? But I, I think in this case, I mean, we've seen two instances where we're really benefiting from one drawing like an extremely similar analogy in the case of the robots uh, that are for reconnaissance, but in, this sense, using it as more of like the analogy is really cool. Uh, I just, I wonder how genetic algorithms really differ from machine learning uh, or if they're of like the same kind. I'm not really versed in <laughs> the operational definition of either one of those, but it's awesome concepts. Yeah, I'm not either, uh, although I did get a little bit behind the scenes here. So it basically swaps these random operators until it finds put into it, right? Such as like population size or probability of, of, uh, you know, swapping these things, these, uh, operators and, um, maximal generation length. So how long you simulate for, so you can adjust all these parameters. This is where I, 
I put in math and then question mark, question mark, question mark, profit, because what came out of this whole thing <laughs> was that uh, you plug you plugged in basically an organization chart that you find in uh, any military setting. And um, the algorithm spits out this uh, optimal layout. And uh, in the example he gave, you know, there's, um, you know, four unique things that come out of this, four unique layouts uh, in a single row of uh, operators. And um, basically, long story short, is it worked and they're going to work on the robustness of it coming up. So I thought that was interesting for sure. Just to take an org chart and spit out like a, a useful operational layout for, based off of that document. I mean, that's that's some serious computation going on there if it's just pulling from that much. And do, did they mention if there has to be any like standardization to it or is the algorithm just be able, pretty much able to make do with what it gets? I don't know, man. That's a, that's a great question that I don't know. <laughs> I, um, yeah, cool. we'll see. We'll have to see. So, um, the, uh, next one was the habitability on U S Navy ships. And, um, let's see here, this one. So obviously habitability on Navy ships, uh, you have a lot of things going on on Navy ships. So for those of you not familiar, you have, Things like noise and light and other people talking and ship noises happening and all this stuff in these birthing containers or these birthing compartments um, where the sailors sleep. And so they define habitability as something where, you know, you have a bunch of different factors uh, influencing how um, habitable a zone is. So climate, duration, that you're in there, crew, morale, safety, health, comfort, performance, Um and really, they were talking about how to apply this to ship design um, and uh, where you have these sort of conflicting demands of the comfort needs and the wartime conditions. You know, you need to fit as many people into a certain container as you as you can, but you also want them to be comfortable. Um, I'm trying to shorten this one up a little bit, but... Uh, they, uh, the, they, the, the bottom line with this one is that the organizational structure can inform a design. So, for example, you could have, um, you know, the people who are working on the same shift go to the same birthing compartment. And, and that way you get rid of one of these factors, which is uh, um, uh, people, other people talking in your area, right? So things like that can inform ship design. And that was the big point with that. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I mean, of course, it'd be really hard to do anything besides like organizational changes. But I mean, that's a great one. I know that like just taking out that factor of like extra ambient noise at night or whenever you're able to whenever you're like off and able to sleep could have like a severe impact on like their ability to do their job the next day and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's a pretty awesome little tidbit to come from the study. Um, cause yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I couldn't imagine they could really redesign the entire ship layout cause these things are huge and they're expensive ship or boat, either one. Yeah, for sure. Um, so moving on to the last one of the potpourri was, uh, workplace satisfaction before and after moving to an open office plan. Um, so basically what they found, I'm, I'm going to skip straight to the results of this one. Um, but, uh, they did this for the D and D or D and D. <laughs> It's the, I'm so tired, everyone. Uh, they did this for the DOD, not the Dungeons and Dragons, but the Department of Defense. <laughs> and uh, oh my God! So they took a couple measures, and uh, basically, what they found was uh, it was more attractive to them, and there was more ad hoc meeting space for them. And strangely enough, privacy. Uh, they they felt like it was easier to have private conversations. What is what I wrote in my notes, and uh, the reason being is that there are these containers called phone booths for uh, private conversations. Oh, so uh, they this... actually enjoyed the open space layout more? Is that what you're saying? In, in these attributes, yeah. So like I said, meeting space, attractiveness, and privacy. There were a bunch of others that uh, – that didn't. So things like noise and distraction, they felt like it was a little bit more distracting because there was more stuff out there. Um, they didn't, they didn't feel like they had their own personal space. Um, 
And then they also looked at things like uh, gender differences and introversion differences as well, where, you know, males liked the new workplace, but females um, who are in the minority maybe found it harder to have these private conversations because of things like uh, like they, they were saying that they had a pregnant person in the office and they couldn't really call their doctor and talk about things. Um, so yeah, interesting paper. Um, so that was the potpourri. That's super uh, interesting, man. That's like that ran like the gamut of things. That was that's a really cool one. It really did, and I attended that one because I, you know, for everything that you say yes to here at HFES, for everything that you attend, you're saying no to six or seven other things, and it's like it's hard because I I want professionally to attend some of these things, um, to get you know the latest and greatest, but also I want I want no fan left behind. I want Everyone, I, I kind of want to bring our listeners something unique that, you know, maybe we don't cover on the show because it's not our area of expertise. So it's 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 tough because, like I said, you got to say no to seven of them to go to one. So uh, I tried to pick something today that would uh, kind of cover that gamut. Well, awesome, man. I mean, I'm enjoying it. I feel like I'm learning a lot just from hearing a little bit about these stories and the different papers that you've kind of heard presented. So. Kudos to you, man. Yeah, and I gotta say, man, I'm like, uh, I wish, I wish somebody else did this for all the other, all of the other uh, sessions because, man, there's so much stuff. And the best thing you can do while you're here is to make friends and kind of talk about, like, hey, what were the big takeaways from these other sessions? So, you know, that's that's really what it comes down to. Oh, 100 percent, man. So, what else did you get into today? <laughs> Well, uh, so the other, the only other thing I did today, aside from a whole lot of networking, was uh, I chaired the virtual environments one session, um, and uh, this one also. So this was measurement and virtual environments, and so if you're not a big fan of VR, you can probably tune out now and be okay. But uh, because I am a big VR person and am a member of the virtual environments technical group, I think. Uh, you know, I I might get a little technical here. So, Blake, I need you to reel me back in case I say something that may not be entirely obvious to people who aren't in this field. All right. Let's so, do it, man. So we had uh, four different papers in my session. And uh, th- uh, basically, let me just go over these at a, at a high level. So you had uh, kind of the impact of user biases towards human skin tone um, when uh, when considering triage in uh, virtual environments. You had um, measuring user experience uh, with postural sway and performance using an HMD, head-mounted display. And then you also had heuristic evaluation for virtual reality, uh, which is the one I was most excited for. And then um, we had virtual reality uh, and gaming on the Rift and how it affects game user satisfaction. Wow. So there's a... Yeah, this is definitely more of a, a... uh, methodology and how do you measure user experience. So let's jump into the skin tone um, article. So this, again, was looking at user biases towards human skin tone on triage errors. Um, and so they used – I'm just going to give the takeaways, man. Uh, so the takeaway for this one is that our biases still persist in a virtual environment even when we embody another avatar that – uh, is of another uh, skin tone. So I'm a white male. If I were to embody an African-American male and I had certain predispositions to other skin tones, those predispositions would not be affected by that, um, by embodying a different skin tone in a virtual environment. Huh, that, that's super interesting because, again, to contrast what we talked about last night because you talked to the guy that had the awesome poster name VR what you eat and yeah in that case it was like if you the idea or as I took it away the idea was to embody the things that you eat to like kind of transition you to wanting to be a vegan now whether that works or not or what or what his like (laughs) outcomes were in the paper it's kind of a contrast here right because you would think that and I know this argument's been made in other places or for other instances and I think specifically with skin tone but you would think that by embodying somebody else's skin you would have it would change your perceptions maybe um but mi- but who knows obviously not it's it's still if you have like predisposed bias prior to coming into the study 
um, which I'm assuming they just measured that before and then measured it once the tasks were going on for errors in triage. Uh, but that's, well, kind of, that's kind of a cool I, contrast. I'm glad you brought that up because the methods that they did use were uh, basically how long it was. Um, oh, let's see here. Uh, it, it was time to attention or time to tending. So like how long did it take to actually tend to somebody depending on the color of their skin tone and also how many errors were performed. So that's kind of how they measured, um, that bias. So there was no physical equivalent or there's no real world equivalent. Uh, I do want to jump into one thing though, with this one, the, uh, the speaker actually left us with a really powerful message. You know, they asked us to close our eyes and imagine the, the person that we love the most. Um, and imagine, if there was a natural disaster, he's from California. So there's, there's a fire going on in the orange County area right now, which is actually where I'm based. So it was very relevant to me, but um, you know, he also brought in the uh, hurricanes and, and earthquakes and fires and tornadoes and all these natural disasters. Imagine the person that you love the most in this situation, not getting the care or attention they need because of the color of their skin. And uh, man, it was powerful. That is really powerful. Wow. I, I can only imagine like after hearing the study results and then kind of doing that little exercise, I mean, that makes it mean so much more. And it, it was something that I completely was blindsided by. Like this, this doesn't happen at these, uh, these panels. Like it's, it's not very interactive. You kind of passively absorb this stuff, but it was, it was an exercise that, uh, really kind of hit home, especially because of the fire. So, um, so that was uh, the first paper. Then we had postural sway. So this one was uh, measuring performance and uh, postural sway and user experience, uh, all within an a, a head-mounted display. The the takeaways from this one was that they kind of used um, this. So they looked at a top-down view of the participant, and they kind of looked at the elliptical area. So how far out from point zero did they sway right um on the x axis then they also looked at the uh x y position and um or sorry not just on the x axis for the elliptical but on the y axis as well and then uh, they also looked at the uh path length right so if you sway very little your path length is going to be very small but if you sway a lot you know you'll have uh, a big line that kind of shows where your path is. Does that make sense? Am I explaining that? Yeah, I'm trying to envision this a little bit, like thinking about it from a listener point of view. So is the person like standing up with the heads up display on? They are. So yeah, and they're doing a couple tasks with this thing on. So they asked them to um to basically point a laser pointer at an object in the room. And then they also uh asked them to oh, what was the other one? They uh find it here oh yeah so they they measured hits and time to hit so gotcha so okay so it's almost as if like you're standing straight up you have a head mounted display on and there's some like imaginary line going down the center of you that's that would if you're still standing straight that would be your baseline and so moving kind of to the right or the left from a top-down view that would be deviations from like the baseline posture is that kind of what they were talking about Yeah, and the baseline actually would be the control. So they did this outside of a virtual environment as well, and that was the control. Um, So the takeaways from this one were that, uh, you know, obviously when you're in a head-mounted display, there's a lot more postural sway and your performance suffers. That's, That's kind of the takeaways there. Is that because the display is heavier on your head, or did they give any kind of real reasoning behind that, or is that because you're standing? That's one, that's one factor of it for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a clunky device. You have it on your head. There's a mismatch between the way that you interact with the environment, because if you're looking through like a camera on your head mounted display, it's going to be different from just seeing it through your eyes. So yeah, there's a couple different things that they mentioned, uh, which actually play well into the next article or the next, uh, presentation today, which was uh, the heuristic evaluation on virtual reality systems. And this was done um, by Rabia Mirza, uh, Rabia Mirza from YouTube. Actually, she's a UX designer at YouTube. And uh, they did, so we have heuristic evaluations for um, 
things like uh, you know desktop or mobile or even video games, but we don't have one for VR. And this one, um, I got I got to hand it to uh, this session. It was very well attended like throughout the entire thing, not just for this one, but this one was a little bit more crowded than, but there were, there were a good 50 people in the room. Like it was, it was a good turnout and uh, I'm very happy with that. So um, basically, yeah, we have Nielsen heuristics, you know, everything that we're familiar with, but um, what they were trying to do was kind of blend ergonomics with interface design so what they did was they took a survey of people who have experience in virtual reality, and they kind of uh, did an affinity diagram of all these issues with hardware and software that they experience. Um, so they found 209 problems, but uh, eventually came up with these heuristics. So I'm just going to go through these, and I'll kind of explain them if they are not self-explanatory here. So we have um, synchronous body movements which is uh, the movements that you make in VR should be analogous to the movements that you make in the physical environment, right? Makes sense. Um, and all these are going to make sense because they are heuristics, right? So physical space, space constraints, str- wow, physical space constraints, you want to have a space where you are going to be able to move around in the virtual environment. Um, and by the way, Blake, remind me after this is done because I want to talk about something else. Uh, immersion. So you want to make them feel immersed. You want it to be free of glitches or glitchiness. So sometimes when you're in a head mounted display, you'll have, uh, the display freak out because of tracking or whatever from the devices you want to switch between actual and virtual world. Now this one was a little, um, not so self-explanatory, but there's some tasks that you want to be able to do in the physical environment versus the virtual environment, such as like checking your phone or checking the battery life of your VR headset or, uh, you know, the time even you're just doing these necessary tasks, um, in order to, uh, uh, but you have to take off the headset to do them. So trying to incorporate those into the design of whatever it is that you're making. You want to, um, wow, that's not the right one. What else here? Cord design. So you want the cord to be accommodating. You don't want there to be a lot of cords. Ideally, there'd be no cord. Um, you want it, you want the uh, headset to be comfortable. You want the visuals to be comfortable and, uh, obviously user interface design, which is basically Nielsen's heuristics. So there's a lot to unpack there. All right. So it's interesting that they took so much of the approach of obvious, cause we've got a pretty good set of heuristics or rules of thumb that we use when it comes to UI design, right? Like Nielsen, there's a lot of other ones that are even out there that people use based off what they like, blah, blah, blah. But it's cool that they took not just the hardware into account, but they are also are taking people's environment into the account of being a heuristic that oh, needs yeah. to be used. Uh, cause that's something I didn't think about cause I've had limited experience actually like being in VR headsets for games or any kind of experience. So that's, that's pretty cool. And it's, I would have never really thought about the need to, okay, I've got to be able to get out of this immersive environment in order to do something like interact with my phone, know how charged my headset is so it just doesn't die on me. Those are things that are important to think about, but it's, it's kind of, it's interesting to think about just because you've got like immersion being one heuristic and then basically to meet another, you have to kind of break that immersion. So that's, that's a cool, like uh, counter paradigm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that other piece of uh, information that I said to remind me about, I'm going to talk about that on Monday's show. That's banter. That's banter worthy. Um, Cause I want to break that down a little bit more than we have time for today. But the last one was uh, gaming on the rift and they were looking at the guest scale, which is game user experience satisfaction scale. Oh yeah, uh, we yeah. love our, we love our acronyms here in Human Factors. So this is, uh, you know, the guest has nine subscales. So we're looking at usability, narrative, um, uh, player engagement, uh, or or engrossment, enjoyment, uh, creative freedom, aesthetics, um, or audio aesthetics, personal gratification, social connectivity, and visual aesthetics. And uh, they were basically looking at the difference between VR and not VR. And um, the uh, at least gaming in the Oculus was higher across the board um, uh, for 
Let's see here. Um, oh, yeah. Not significant was usability, narratives, and social. Like I said, I couldn't transcribe these notes digitally, so it's hard to read my chicken scratches. Um, but, I mean, that makes sense, right? The narrative is going to be the same. The usability is going to be pretty much the same across both of them, and the social aspect is going to be the same as well. But having just experienced this in VR is already just a, a, a bonus to a lot of these things. And, you know, the point was brought up is this because VR is a novel experience for a lot of people, and that's some of the next steps. So it'll just be interesting to see where this goes. Um you know, what, what other different types of games can we try, different genres, different headsets, motion controls, that kind of thing? Honestly, yeah, I'm wondering if the novelty of the VR experience is why you're not seeing a difference in usability. Because I figure I would think there would be some kind of difference, whether in the positive or negative, I'm not really sure. But just because it's like a, it's a new experience, it's totally different than what I've ever been used to the few times that I've been in VR. Uh, so I, honestly, from like, again, this is personal anecdote, but I would like think the usability is higher based on that, like immersion thing for me, because I feel like I'm much more a part of the game or, or maybe I'm, maybe I'm just saying that even thinking maybe the narrative would be, um, I would rate the narrative higher. So that's interesting that they didn't see any kind of real difference there. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, man, hit that thing. Let's get out of here. All right. <laughs> that's it for today, everyone. <laughs> that's it for today guys do you guys like our second bonus episode let us know what you think uh if you guys saw something interesting here at hfes today let us know you can follow us all over social media head on over to the human factors cast linkedin facebook or twitter at h factors podcast you can join our discussion on the soundcloud or send us an email at human factors cast at gmail.com leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432 that's 901-646-1hfc or you can support us on our patreon site at patreon.com slash human factors cast if you like what we're doing and want to support us financially because doing this every day at hfvs is draining uh but it might not be as draining if i had some money coming in just kidding uh but seriously if you don't do that go ahead and like subscribe review us on apple Podcasts, google play store or whatever your favorite podcast directory is and of course you can always reach us at our home on the web humanfactorscast.com Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, thank you for the third day in a row for helping me break down all the news from HFES 2017 in Austin, Texas. Where can our listeners find you if they want to talk about VR or any of the potpourri items today? Oh, man, you guys can always hit me up about VR, potpourri, hot dog banter, anything you like on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. And thanks, Nick, for doing this for the third night in a row. I know it's been draining for you, but I have enjoyed it so much. You keep me going, and so do our listeners. Uh, as for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast until, I guess, tomorrow. It depends. It depends on the content for tomorrow. Depends on tomorrow. I might not even go to anything tomorrow. I'm so tired. I'm so tired, Blake. I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>